Mm. Um, I think this hybrid model of, of vacation rental and hotel, um, I really wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of years, you see, you actually see brands coming out and maybe it's an Airbnb branded hotel. I know they were playing with that in Florida, uh, last year, a couple of years ago. Um, this, this is probably where the industry is going. What's up, everybody? My name is Mike Shogren here with my co-host, Emmanuel Pani. We're part of a group of specialized real estate investors you've probably never heard of. We didn't start with deep pockets or wealthy families, and we don't rely on 401ks, mutual funds, or traditional real estate investing. In fact, many of us don't even own the properties that fund our freedom. If you ask the money experts out there, they'd say what we do is impossible, yet it's happening every single day. It's happening through a new niche called short-term rentals. We are Short-Term Rental Nation, and these are our secrets. What's going on, SCR Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Rental Secrets Podcast. I am your host, Mike Shogren, here with my main man and brother from another mother, Mr. Emmanuel Pani. What's going on, E? Mikey, Mike. Everything is great, man. The real estate market is wilding right now. Wilding. Like, I got two offers accepting two different places since we recorded our podcast this morning. Um, and in these moments, you do want to think that you're like, God, I'm so good at my job. But I'm also realizing that maybe just the market that is very crazy and, and I'm just average. Um, but nonetheless, I am super stoked, very grateful for it. Um, we have so many people coming over to the house tomorrow. Um, so I'm making bread and the usual Italian immigrant kind of things that you expect an Italian to do. So making bread making tomato sauce and all the good stuff. Um, but life is good. I can't complain. What about you, brother? Things are good. Things are good. I'm <clears throat> helping a student right now with a 22 unit hotel that they just closed down in Daytona. Um, Kristen's doing all the designs for them, getting all those orders in. I'm helping them start thinking about the systems and getting all that stuff rolling and, the timeline for completing renovations to when they're going to roll out certain rooms and getting all that stuff squared away more from an operational standpoint. So it's exciting. It's their first hotel. They're uh, excited and nervous at the same time, but uh, it's a great location and uh, looking forward to seeing what the finished product looks like. So, yeah. And I'm sure, and I'm sure you'll probably get some more ideas as to how to organize and set up everything after we're done with this podcast with Adam as uh, I'm super stoked because he's a hospitality expert um, as I mentioned in the last episode and, um, it's exciting to see hospitality experts now coming and talking about Airbnb. Um, because as, as we you all know, I've been doing this for so long, then hospitality kind of looked down on Airbnbs for a very long time. Right. It was kind of like this weird thing of like, you're never going to last to share your house with somebody. Um, so now I'm very, very excited, uh, to have Adam come on. Um, and I'll let you read his bio, but it's, it's exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting my pen and paper out to take some notes today. So today we have, as he mentioned, a very special guest, Adam Knight. Uh, Adam is the principal at Knowing Hospitality. They're a full service hotel management company, and he is the host of the Proven Principles podcast. He brings 25 years experience across luxury brands and independent companies, a hospitality veteran and operations expert. He's lived and worked all over North America and the Caribbean. He loves the left brain, right brain dichotomy of the hospitality industry. One minute you're diving into a PL, the next you're tasting the new seasonal menu in the restaurant. His passion lies in understanding how things work and making them better, be it small service experiences or large scale project management. So without further ado, Adam, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, likewise, likewise. We're excited to have you. So Take us back. You've got a, a long track record of being in the hospitality industry. Kind of take us back to, to the beginning of how you got into this and where it's taken you. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny because I look back, it's been 25 years this past September. I hit the, uh, I hit the quarter century mark and I don't feel like I'm even old enough to be a bit in the industry <laughs> that long, enough. but I mean, I know, thank you. So they've got a little bit of gray going on in the beard here, but uh, other than that, it's yeah, 25 years, it goes by super fast. My very first job in a hotel, I was 17. So if you do the math, I'm 42. Um, I was 17 and I got a job as a pot washer at a ski resort at a, a Canadian Pacific hotel, which is now called Fairmont Hotels. 
in the Canadian Rockies. And it was right out of high school. It's the one thing I knew for sure is I didn't want to go to college. Oh, I just wanted to get out and work. So I finished high school and I moved to a ski resort and started working. Um, and honestly, it just kind of went from there. I did. I never got out of it. I just, you know, I fell in love with the chance to meet people from all around the world. There was so much energy and excitement in, in, in a dynamic environment with all kinds of things always going on around you. And this was in the kitchen as a pot washer let alone, you know, getting into other sides of the business. So uh, I wrapped up that job. I moved back to my hometown of Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, got a job as a bellman at a hotel. Did that for a few years uh, and then uh, got promoted to front desk. And at this point, I was like five years in and we started thinking I should probably go back to school. Um, so at 22 or 23, I ended up getting into a hotel management program uh, in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, going in as the old man for sure at 23 with 17 and 18 year olds, uh, in the course that was great. And then the career really took off from there. I joined up with, uh, with Fairmont again and, um, spent the better part of my career with them all over Canada. I moved to the Caribbean for a little while, uh, and then all over the U S I came to the U S in 2004 and really haven't looked back. Um, my journey was all through operations. So I started in food and beverage, moved into rooms, went back to food and beverage, and then finally took over as a director of operations at a, a Fairmont in Newport Beach, where I think is now Marriott. Uh, and that was my first overarching responsibility in uh, having uh, multiple divisions reporting into me. And then ended up leaving the company as a general manager, moved back to California, took on a VP of operations role for a, a small company based in the Bay Area, and then came up to Seattle a couple of years ago where I'm based now. Uh, started my company knowing hospitality as uh, a way to uh, help small independent owners and bankers, lenders on properties, uh, stabilize hotels and, and how to make them more professionalized, uh, more um, uh, professionalized, you know, easy, figure out, you know, different revenue streams, checklists that need to be put in place, whatever it need, you need to do to stabilize a hotel. That's what the company takes care of. I love that. And I've, I've been saying this for probably about a year now. So we, we purchased our first boutique hotel in February and renovated it, got that up and running. It's been going great. And I've implemented a lot of the systems that I've learned through doing short-term rentals the last few years. And I've been saying that I, I feel this boutique mom and pop boutique hotel industry right now is the biggest opportunity in real estate currently, because a lot of people are terrified to touch it but there's so much opportunity there with all of the new technology and all of the new resources available to really professionalize that type of operator and take those properties to the next level. I think it's just a massive opportunity. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, when you look at how hospitality is performing at a macro level, it's those smaller drive markets. It's the, the independent operators in the cities where large urban cores go to drive to vacation. Those are the ones that are outperforming the urban centers right now. And I'm sure we're going to get into it. Airbnb plays a big part of that. Um, you know, those, those vacation rentals are even outperforming that segment of hospitality. So there's a, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. Mm. Yeah. And, um, uh, I love, I love it because I, I, I see myself in how your background went right from doing all the back of the house and then moving to management. My, my background was very much very similar, um, but very different at the same time. So from what you see now, and we kind of touched on real quick now with this, the small mom and pop hotels, but before we talk about overall the hospitality, what do you think 2021, what's the outlook from your side of the fence from, from both a hospitality in general, like including restaurants and everything else? And then what do you see um, the hotel industry doing. I know we talked briefly about it on your podcast that you mentioned, if I remember correctly, unquote, it's going to be an absolute bloodbath in 2021. And that's what you said. <laughs> so I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to remember about this and see exactly what he means uh, when it comes to our side. Yeah. Uh, it sounds so dire uh, when you, when you repeat my words back to me, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's true. I think, Look, nobody really knows what's going to happen next year in the space. 
there's a lot of inputs and a lot of things at play. And just at a high level to think about kind of why it's so difficult to get visibility on this. The first thing is that in the hotel business, the type of guest staying in a hotel is very seasonal. And so if you break down the type of travelers, again, at a macro level, you've got leisure travelers, you've got group travelers, and you've got business travelers. And all of those people fill in the holes in a hotel at different times of the year. And they, you know, you'll know, you have more business travelers than leisure travelers, more group travelers than business travelers. And that sort of goes through the year like this. Um, so what we ended up seeing at the end of the summer was that after all the leisure travel dried up, right? Because that what usually happens right around Labor Day, everyone goes back to school. That is usually picked up by group and business travel. And that carries you through into the holiday season when leisure travel picks up again and the business travel tends to drop off. And then you get into the first part of the new year, group travel starts to pick up again. You start seeing the conventions and the conferences happening in some of the big cities. And then that launches you into the rest of the year with you know your leisure travel again through late spring and into summer. Well, business and group isn't really traveling right now. Uh, and leisure is obviously depressed. And there's no depressed meaning demand and travel's depressed, not people are depressed. Um, <laughs> there's no indication that any of those segments are going to come back in any appreciable numbers anytime soon. And if you look at, the, there's a company called uh, Smith Travel Research, STR, STAR, and they put out uh, weekly figures for every market. Um, it is a, it's a big data collection subscription service that many, many hotels belong to. But you can just go to their website and see how the country is performing at a high level. And so we're starting to see now the numbers, while at a national level, they ticked up uh, pretty close to 50% uh, about a month ago, they're starting to creep back down. They're back down into the 40s, high 40s right now, and they're starting to go down again, uh, even further than that, back down into pre-summer numbers. And that's a pretty good indication, again, if you needed some more data points to support the theory that these segments are traveling, you can just look at that, you can see. Um, so that's probably going to be the case as we move into the new year. Um, the other side of the business here, and why I said it was probably going to be a, a bit of a bloodbath, is that you know it's no secret that there's no government support. There's no stimulus packages. There's nothing really in place uh, really since I think it was at the end of May when all that stuff, um, when the last package was was passed. Uh, and a lot of the protections are expiring on December 26th. So what part of those packages have been and part of the stimulus and, and government protections have been, it has been around loan repayments and, um, and, and forbearance on loans and uh, bankruptcy protection and all of that, which you know we could probably get into if you wanted to. Um, if those expire, there's a whole bunch of people who own hotels that haven't been able to pay their loans. So you could make you can make an educated guess to say, you know, either a bunch of hotels are going to go into foreclosure, the banks are going to the owners are going to give the keys back. And we're starting to see that now. Or um you know, there's going to be obviously broader impacts on the economy with the financial system. So we have a lot of things that we still need to work out on the business side of hotels. And when you've got all of the guests that pay those bills and allow you to repay those loans, not traveling right now, it's, it's a long-winded answer, but I think you could see that it doesn't take very long where you get to this inflection point where um, there's no money flowing through the system. And, right. you know, that's, that's where we're going to be. I yeah, think. Right. And I, we've touched on it quite a bit. So I know the majority of my portfolio, we've got properties in, in four different states and the majority are, <clears throat> call it 40, 45 minutes outside of any major urban hub. So I don't operate inside of any major urban hub and the data has shown and psychologically it makes sense that you know, those heavy urban markets are the ones that got hit the hardest because during a pandemic, nobody wants to go to a city with millions of people. Right. They want to get out of this city. So a large chunk of our travel currently has been a lot of these workcations. So our stays are tending to be longer. And even at the hotel, we're getting people that'll go for two or three days and I'm seeing them in our, our lounge. They're working, they're, you know, enjoying some quiet time, but they're blending that work leisure travel mm -hmm. so 
I feel like, and I'd love your opinion on this is how do more hotels and short-term rentals market to that traveler? Like how, how do you advertise? How do you capitalize on that travel trend right now? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I th- what hotels have not done very well forever is market to the five blocks around the property. And I'm talking in urban core, right? Um, mm-hmm. But if it's not a special occasion, Mother's Day, Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas, when do you go into a hotel in your own town? Like you might get a drink once in a while, but probably never. And you probably, you never stay there. So that's, that's an untapped market that hotels only now are starting to see the potential of. They're selling, to your point, uh, flexible workspace, come to the lobby, you know, hang out for a couple hours and we'll give you, you know, whatever you need to do your job and, or rent a room for half of a day and you can run Zoom calls or whatever you need to do, get away from the kids. Um, at the same time, maybe get your dry cleaning done, uh, use the gym if the gym is even open wherever your hotel is, which I don't think is probably the case, but you get the point. So this is a huge untapped market. Market to the people around your property and sell these services because the guests aren't coming in. They're not traveling in any numbers that you're going to be able to uh, drive any significant revenue in your property. Meanwhile, you, you potentially have millions of people around your, in your city that want to come in and get out of the house because the kids are screaming and they can't get any work done. Uh, and they'll, they'll buy a, a block of time every so often from you to, to be able to get their jobs done or just get away from the craziness. Hmm. That's fascinating. Absolutely. I didn't think about that. I think the other piece too, and I'm curious on what your take is, and I would imagine that this will be the trend going forward, but I feel like we were planning on doing this before COVID hit anyway, but we implemented a contactless check-in system in our hotel. So there's no front desk where people need to go and check in. We use the smart Wi-Fi locks. Everybody gets their own personal access code, last four digits, of their phone number. We've got it set up so, you know, there's extra toiletries and extra things strategically placed in the hotel so they can grab whatever they need. And obviously we're available if they need anything, but it parlayed in perfectly when we opened the hotel in June that with COVID going on, like we heavily marketed that this was like contactless, getting, basically getting rid of that stigma that you're in this, this cesspool of germs and that you don't need to see anybody you can just Mm -hmm. go to your room enjoy the space everything's cdc compliant with our cleaning guidelines contactless check-in and our overhead is way down compared to most hotels because we don't have a lot of staff that need to man things granted it's a different experience so you have to set the stage for what guests can expect there's no bellman there's there's nothing like that but it's a different experience. So I'm curious on your take. Do you see that being a, a more normal trend? Maybe not at the larger scale, but for more of that boutique hotel spot. Oh yeah, 100%. 100%. I think ex- what you're talking about right now is exactly what we're going to start to see more of. I think in diff- at different levels, at varying levels, at every tier of hotel in the industry. After 2008, 2009, and there was a whole bunch of people laid off, uh, there were a a lot of positions and a lot of jobs that never came back. It's absolutely going to be the same thing here. Once we figure out how to meet the needs of the guests and not have a a negative, not have them have a negative experience or have negative reviews come back on the property um, and, you know, be able to lower costs and in, in either, you know, keep profitability flat or, you know, bring more money to the bottom line. As soon as we figure out that inflection point, that's going to be the place that everybody runs to. Hmm. Um, I think this hybrid model of, of vacation rental and hotel, um, I really wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of years, you see, you actually see brands coming out and maybe it's an Airbnb branded hotel. I know they were playing with that in Florida, uh, last year, a couple of years ago. Um, this, this is probably where the industry is going hmm. and it may carve out a whole new segment of hotels at the same time. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll see, you know, the other side of it is, you know, so many hotel companies operate on the franchise model now. And if, 
if an owner, if somebody who wants to get a franchise that that is potentially brings higher profit, but you also get the benefit of being part of a larger organization, and you have you have the Holiday Inn Express flag on your building or the whatever flag on your building, but you can have a stripped down offering for your guests where they don't feel like they're missing anything, or that's the whole point of the brand is that it's a more stripped down experience for them and the, the price is priced accordingly. Um, that could be huge. I might be giving Marriott an idea right now. I don't know. <laughs> giving me some ideas. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So in your experience, it sounds like you, you focused your call it consulting business primarily on that independent operator. What are some of the challenges that you've seen from that operator that most likely translate to a lot of short-term rental operators that you focus a lot of your attention on with them? Yeah, it's it really comes down to a few things. Um, the first is that most independent, actually, you could probably make the argument that a lot of large ones too, but most independent operators don't have any sort of sophisticated revenue management system. So, you know, they don't, they don't know what they're, they're, there's either no tool or system in place. And, you know, we all know the big guys that do revenue management, duettos and, and of that of the world. Uh, so there's nothing like that in place. There's no real understanding of what's going on in the market. Who are their competitors? What are the demand drivers to the location? Um, you know, what, what is the seasonality of traveler coming to location? What's, what events are going on that you can market around there? So there's that whole thing. Um, and then just the, you know, understanding what to charge when, and that it is dynamic and you have to constantly be looking at it. You can't, if you can just set a rate and forget it, but I, you're leaving money on the table and that's definitely not the way that you should be doing things. So that's the first one. That's the big one. The second one is, you know, in tandem to that is, is a marketing plan. And again, many just, they don't know where to spend the money. Um, and I mean, marketing's tough sometimes, right? Because you don't always get metrics. You don't get valuable metrics to, to know if you're putting good money out there, if you're throwing good money after bad money, like it could be tough. So coming up with a very simplified marketing plan and then operational effectiveness is the last one. How, how in communication with your guests are you? What do you know about the people staying with you? Uh, you know, how do you clean your rooms? How long does it take to clean a room? What's the checklist that you use to go through cleaning your room? How often do you do preventative maintenance? How often do you check all of your uh, heavy equipment in the hotel? What's the, what's the PM program for that uh, in maintaining the assets? So, so those are usually the three buckets that, that uh, independent owners fall into. And we can, there's more, but those are the, the dials that we tend to turn. Sure. So I think yeah. I know a big change for me going from the short-term rentals to the boutique hotel was I feel like we we're a little bit spoiled. Like we had a, a guest about a month ago from a company called price labs that does dynamic pricing for short-term rentals. So they pull in all your local competitors and they'll adjust your rates for you dynamically. Mm -hmm. And so when I got into the hotel space, maybe it's my lack of research, but I didn't find anything like that. So I was manually going in and trying to do that on a regular basis. Now I've got a new property management system that we're onboarding that at least pulls in all my comps rates so I can adjust it based on that. But mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything else that almost automatically adjusts it based on local supply, demand, things like that on the hotel side. Yeah. Oh, there is for sure. Yeah. There's, there's uh, service providers out there that, that do exactly that. They'll, they'll pull rates constantly from competitors uh, and it, it'll examine, you know, how, how many people are looking at your site? How many, how many people do you lose through the booking process? Um, you know, the, the cart abandonment as it, mm -hmm. you know, as it was, mm -hmm. um, it'll look at seasonality. It'll look at, you know, it'll benchmark you against where you were same time last year. Now that's obviously if you're just a new property, you don't have last year's statistics that doesn't help you, but you'll at least be able to benchmark where you were and where you could be. And then when you throw in all of the other demand drivers for a location, you'll be, it, it'll give you recommendations on where it thinks you should be. It also rate shops your competitors. So you know where they're at, um, which is just to make sure that you're priced appropriately. Yeah. So what has been kind of like 
a theme for us lately that we've seen is is how much of bringing hospitality into the Airbnb business and really like all the value. Because once we remove the overlays of hospitality, obviously if you're a Hilton, you probably have a lot of check and balances in place, right? That make your system is a little bit probably heavier. But if you're one of our guys, let's say somebody like me or like Mike, that you have a small place, like 20, 30, 40 units, there's so much learning that can happen by you just analyzing how hotels kind of do it and then replicating it. Mm -hmm. Um, So if we have one of those guys listening right now, what do you think is one of the biggest things, but yet the easiest thing that people could implement for their Airbnb business from the hospitality side? We talked about this now with the pricing. Mm -hmm. Um, What else could be a low hanging fruit that will make a big difference? The, the mindset that people need to get into is that to understand that you, you sell experiences, you don't see when you buy something from most other organizations, you have a thing to take with you, right? So you can say, I put $20 and I bought this thing. We don't, we don't sell anything else other than a stay. And you can't take that with you. You just take the memories and the feeling of that experience with you. Mm-hmm. So, and that could be really hard to get your head around because that experience on one day could be a hundred dollars. And that experience the next day could be $200 and nothing materially changed about the experience, right? You're just pricing it based off of demand. So what some of the best hotels do is they have a very good understanding throughout the entire business that you have to stay in touch with all of your guests. You have to know, obviously, who's coming and who's going, what, why they're there, ideally, if you can get that information. But you know, the best hotels now are doing outreach before the guests arrive through text message or email, understanding what that person needs while they're there, what some of their likes and dislikes are, or just flat out welcoming them to the hotel. And opening that line of communication, especially through text, which is, believe it or not, now starting to become big in the hotel space. <laughs> We're about a decade behind the curve there. But um, opening up those lines of communication to say, if you need anything before you get in, while you're here, this is who you should contact. I'm Adam, I'm whoever. Um, what time are you going to be here? We can have your room ready to go. You'll, you know, If you like Diet Cokes, we can have a bunch of them in the, in the room for you. Whatever the thing is, um, just being proactive in communication and heading off any issues that might result in an unhappy guest leaving your hotel before they leave. Because once they're gone, you're finished. You can't fix it. You have to get it while they're on property. So if you can know as much about them as possible before they arrive, anticipate any potential issues while they're there and fix them before they leave, you're going to do 80% of the work. Mm. Makes, out. Yeah, that makes total I love sense. That. Yeah, and 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 the beautiful thing for me hearing that <laughs> is it is exactly the point of my question, right? It's such a low hanging fruit because as an Airbnb operator, for you to do this, it's a little bit easier because the entire system is kind of already set on the concept of you talking to somebody, and there is the element of like creating friendship almost right because i know a lot of hosts that it's easier for you to think about speaking like that candidly as like hey this is what we need for our stay when you book it on airbnb rather than the hotel because the hotels we have gotten used to the way it has always been which is always something very very oh yeah i mean you know just just put yourself in a guest shoes for a second here i had this experience earlier in the year when i stayed at a airbnb in vancouver when you're going to a hotel, you know what you're looking for, right? There's a driveway and a big lit up sign. You know where you're going. When you're going to a new city in a neighborhood, almost certainly, right? Where it could be in a quiet part of town where there's not a lot of activity going on. And you're looking for a condo building or, you know, a house on a street. And if you, if the owner or the host didn't contact you ahead of time to say, you know, Hey, I'll meet you here. Or this is where the keys are, or can't wait for you to get there. This is, if you have trouble finding the keys, just call me and I'll tell you where they are. Anything like that. You alleviate so much anxiety around the experience. 
And it's so simple. All you have to do is, because you have their contact information, reach out to them and just open that line. It makes a huge difference. You remove so much uncertainty and anxiety when someone's traveling to a place. Now, if you're go, if you have an entire building, you know, as you gentlemen are talking about, that is, that that's a, in the short term rental. That's maybe, maybe not as anxiety ridden as going to an individual unit in an entire building. But the principle is the same. If you are proactive in communication and just make sure that you win over every single guest every single time, you're going to be successful. Hundred percent. Bottom line. To, to turn that into just tactical advice for people, thinking through that experience, we've evolved our messaging and it's so easy now with all the technology that we have. So when somebody books a place, automatically triggers for us all of their information for their upcoming stay. Three days before they get there, we send a follow-up, hey, we're so excited to welcome you. Here's a link to the guidebook. Here's the address. Here's where to look for. Here's the parking, all of that. Then the day of check-in, we shoot them a text, just a reminder, hey, here's your code again. Just want to make sure you're good. Welcome you. Four hours after check-in, hey, how are you settling in? Is everything up to, a, you know, we want to give you a five-star experience. So if there's an issue, we're going to know about it immediately after check-in and we can address it. And to Adam's point, not wait until they check out. And then they're like, that was terrible. You guys missed this, this, and this. So just over communicating like, we want you to have an amazing stay. I'm here for you. Like, just let me know if there's an issue. I know that I, you're a hundred percent right. It, and I know that it either sounds so simple that it can't work or it sounds so tedious and laborious to get in touch with every single person. How could I possibly do that and manage all of their requests and everything that they would need? But the truth of the matter is, is that most people aren't going to ask anything of you. They're right. They're just, they won't great. Even I'll call you. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them won't even respond. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you set it up to your point, if you're automated about it and you don't actually have to do a lot of work um, in sending out 40 individual emails or texts, um, it's very simple to manage. And you can be sure that you're winning over people and basic and, and really creating raving fans one person at a time. Yeah. And, 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 the other thing that Mike kind of said as he was talking about all the all the messages that I don't want to kind of fall through the track, uh, through the cracks, um, it is a huge opportunity for you to put in the back of their mind what you're looking for, right? Because also as a host, what you're looking for is for them to leave a five-star review when they leave, right? So you can put that in your messages over and over so that they make sure what the expectation is what you're trying to accomplish and then vice versa, what the expectation is that if we are able to give you that five-star review, it will mean the world to us to leave it here. And then you'll just keep trickling it in there because the only goal is to give you a five-star review and you keep trickling it in there. And then once you ask for the review at the end of the stay, they've already been primed the entire time to know what they're supposed to do with it. Oh yeah, for sure. The, there's not a lot of hotels, but a lot of successful properties actively recruit guests to leave a review, no matter what their experience was, right? Because you want it to be authentic. You don't, I mean, as much as we all would like to have nothing but five-star trip advisors or five-star reviews, the reality is, is like, someone's not going to like the experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but, but you also, you just to be authentic to people that are viewing your listing, you want to make sure that people feel free to, to say exactly what their experiences was, were like. They don't want to feel coerced. And, and you also don't want to cherry pick the guests who would leave a review, right? Mm -hmm. Where you only get the five-star reviews uh, that are put in there. Because you know I, we see this in the hotel space all the time where a big thousand room hotel uh, who's been open for you know many years and you go to the TripAdvisor page and they only have like a couple hundred TripAdvisor reviews. You're like, I know you've had more guests than that. What's going on over here? Like, how, are you, and they're all five-star reviews and you're yeah. like, I know that, <laughs> I know that, that you're can't not asking true. for them or, or you're just asking. Yeah. It seems character. inauthentic, right? It doesn't seem genuine. So you know, I guess, I don't know what my point is in saying that, but I, you know, <laughs> recruit them, yeah. Yeah. but you know, just be, don't cherry pick them, you know, you no, wanna... and, and I, I like also 
and I did just this now, um, I went to Texas and I actually like to read, read the bad reviews more than the good ones. And I do that when I buy a product too. Right. And it's really understanding what, what, where is the merit? Like, is there any merit or is the guy or the girl just not happy with their life and they're just trying to destroy the place. Right. And you can tell, right. When you read yeah. a review, oh, you know absolutely. what you're reading yeah. and other people do too. For yeah, sure. exactly. So there is no need to be scared of it. But as long as, again, you can really mitigate the situation by how you respond to it. And I have a ton of times problems. And then people say there were problems, but the way that they handled it made all the difference, which is the most important couple of words that you can have. Because that's all people care about. People want to know if I get there and something is going on, is there a person to talk to yeah. which is that one thing that hotels have over Airbnbs, right? That there is always, there is the infrastructure of, I can call the reception, I can call so-and-so and somebody will be here and fix it now. Exactly. But if we can address that on our side as well, and that's all goes back to Mike and Adam's <laughs> superpower is like, how good are you creating your operations and, and, really knowing when something goes wrong, how do you fix it? That's right. Sorry, Mike, you're saying something. No, I was, I was going to echo what you said. I, I, I feel like the, the negative reviews are the best opportunity to win more bookings because the way you respond to them, never respond if you're angry, first off, take a minute. But if you respond the right way and appreciate the feedback, to your point, people can tell when somebody's just angry and they're writing a bad review. Mm -hmm. But the way that you respond to that review is huge. And my wife is a ninja with that. So she handles that because I'm not the best with it. But the way she words it, I'm like, man, that was so good. Like people are like, wow, they really care and they're actually listening. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. like if you don't respond, it's just like, oh, yeah, they it, don't care. It's a totally different effect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely is. Uh, you know, the thing to, the thing to keep in mind when you're responding to negative reviews is that you're not trying to win an argument and you're definitely not trying to win an argument in an online forum where everybody yeah. can see <laughs> what's going record. on, right? That's not good for you yeah. as the, as the it, owner. It is really funny though. So if you are a, um, one of my competitors right here in Florida and you want to do that, I encourage it and you should send me the screenshots so I can read them afterwards. <laughs> exactly. Quite hilarious. There's probably a, a coffee table book that could be made about bad reviews, be funny. bad, bad review responses. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one thing I, d I do want to talk about because to ease point, I feel like my, one of my skill sets is really creating systems and process. And I would love your two cents on this because the, the challenge I see with most short-term rental hosts is they love what they do. They love the hospitality, but from a business standpoint, they really can't scale because they're not treating it like a business and they don't understand how, what does it even mean to create a process and how to delegate everything from the cleaning to the maintenance to the checking. And like from the folks that we've had that have 100, 200 plus short-term rentals, the, the key thread through all of them is you have to treat it like a business. You have to learn how to create standard operating procedures, delegate, have quality controls. So from, from your standpoint, what are some, I guess, best practices? I know you mentioned like checklist, things like that, but what are some like actionable things that I know for me, once I hit about five units, it was like, all right, time to up my game because it, mm -hmm. you're not going to get further than that until you really dial it in and you, you create that standard system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's honestly, that's the secret sauce. I wish I could give you uh, an, another silver bullet, but the reason that, you know, when you look at a four seasons, for example, you know, they're the gold standard in the industry for, you know, how to run a great hotel. They're able to do what they do because they systematize a lot of back end processes. They're obsessive about training and the people care about what they're doing. So there's integrity in how they do their jobs. They do the right thing, even when nobody's looking because it's the right thing to do. When there's no opportunity to get praise, they still do the right thing because it's just the right thing to do. Mm. So, 
you know, I think back to my experience of some really like big, complicated operations. You know, I, yes, of course I had department managers and supervisors and we had a lot of meetings and we'd get together and talk about uh, guest feedback. We'd talk about, uh, you know, issues that were going on. We talk about staffing. We talk about upcoming business and, and look at some uh, past and future expected results, like the forecast. So we had some visibility. We, do, we typically what we do is we would look back a week and we'd look forward a week in every single meeting. So we'd try to we'd Monday morning quarterback everything and then look ahead. Hmm. But a level deeper than that is, you know, there were checklists in place for everything, so that it didn't matter who was doing the job they could grab the checklist and they could go do the thing that had to get done. If, if Mike was ca called in sick one day, then Pete could come in and, and, you know, do the tasks that needed to get done so that we never lost any ground. And that's really what it's all about. Well thought out checklists um, and, and inspecting what you expect. It's an overused uh, term in the industry. I don't know if it's relevant in any other industry, but we use it all the time that it, when you're training and you set up checklists, you always have to go back around behind the team that's doing the job and make sure that they're doing everything the way that it needs to get done. It's not necessarily the integrity piece, but not everybody has the same eye for detail. And if you're in a leadership position, or if you have multiple units, you have to have an eye for detail. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to have this like running checklist in your head that when you go into your unit after somebody's been there and before the next guest comes in, that you very quickly can scan a place and open some drawers and you know you know exactly what you're looking for. And when it's missing, you have to be able to you know pull the person back and have them fix it so that they know the next time that that's how they should do things. It's really no more complicated than that, but it's just a level of attention to detail and a level of involvement that, um, that makes the best run hotels so successful. Yeah. And, uh, I was smiling as you were saying that, because I remember when my wife, Natasha came on to work with me and running our, our property. Um, I used to, at the beginning, I used to do everything right. So I had maintenance Wednesday where I would do all the maintenance around the complex from 4 to 5 p.m., I would do all the maintenance calls for the day. I would check all the units after the cleaning people, right? So when she came on, I'm like, I need you to run the back of the house. I need you to run the cleaning, and I need you to check after the cleaners. So she made a checklist. And anytime that we had a lot of turnovers, right? So we have like January 1st, February 1st, we have a big turnover for seasons. We'll have 18, 19, 20 units check in on the same day. So those would be the days that I would have to go and do it. And she would give me a clipboard and I've never used the clipboard because I did it for so long. That was exactly that, right? Like I remember from all the times that I went and I could rapidly check all the units because I had created that, but then that got translated into the checklist. So the first few times I would look at the checklist, I'm like, this is missing. This is missing. This is missing. How do you know? It's because I looked at it and it's not in the checklist you need to add it to the checklist yep. and that makes it perfect over time. Yeah. And it lets, it keeps you on task when you're busy too, right? Cause when you're busy and you just have a whole bunch of things to do, you will skip over so many things because yeah. you need to get all these yeah. other things done. Or you just, or you're just a human, right? Like there's also the reality that sometimes my cleaning girl that is absolutely amazing has things on her mind. So exactly. if she doesn't have a checklist, that is actually a visible thing of this is what I need to remember. Mm -hmm. She's just having a day. Like she's, she's like a lot of us do. Right. Yeah. Have a day. Yeah. And you know, to your point about maintenance day and doing all the tickets, the person doing the cleaning, they have to have an eye for that, for a little, a level of detail about what's broken, what doesn't look right. You know, who's, who's taking care of the, the grout in the bathroom. Right. So are it is, are you doing deep cleaning once a week or, you know, do you have a, a different thing that gets deep cleaned every single day so that at the end of a week, you know, that everything has been done uh, mm. in the unit. So, you know, you always have to be thinking a level deeper, how do I make it easier for the people to do their jobs, but still hit the level of, of, of detail 
in the work that they're doing because it ultimately affects the guest experience. Yeah. And what processes are lacking or the other side of that coin is sometimes we put processes in place that make it harder for people to do their jobs. Yeah. So, I so mean, I'm not easier for them to report it to. I'm not advocating process a checklist overall. I'm just advocating smart thinking through how people do their work to make it most effective. And checklists are, are the way that most do that. Yeah. And if I, if I think about, cause I actually just updated a module in my course for this, cause a bunch of my students are at that point now. And if I think of the evolution that I've gone through and it's first, it's figuring out, all right, what is taking up a lot of my time that I can delegate and kind of documenting all that and then creating those checklists and the SOPs and visual guides so that I want things to look a certain way. And you, you know, you start to train them and you onboard them and you review things. And then I got to a certain point and I hired a business coach fairly recently. And one of the things we were talking about that I hadn't really talked or thought about much was culture. And it made me think of it when you said the four seasons thing. Hmm. And I'm so grateful because my team is amazing. But the more that we engage with the team, when you're at that level now where everybody knows what they need to do, but you create that culture of a cohesive team and we're on the same page and we're moving in the right direction, it's a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is. When you, when you get that buy-in, right? It's, it's not just doing it because Mike told me to do it. It's like, we're, we're going, we have a vision and we're all on the same team. It's, yeah. a, it's amazing. There's a, a book called good to great. That mm. uh, one of the, the core tenants in that book is uh, making sure that you've got the right people on the bus, but, you know, taking it a step further, it's making sure you have the right people in the right seat Seats. on the right bus. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's, yes. and that's a big one. So, you know, you, you want to make sure that when you're building your team, you, you don't necessarily find like-minded people, but we're people who are, who fill the role that you need them to fill, but ultimately that sounds so redundant to say, but what I mean is like, you might need an operations person and you might need someone who's really good at marketing and you might need somebody who's good at process and someone who's really good at money. You, know, you need to find these people strategically to build your team. And that's how you get everybody going in the right direction with a, with a, a common vision and mission. Mm. And it's funny because I love, I love that Mike knew where I was going because that is what I wrote down and underlined. It's like, how do you find how do you find those great people and how do you teach that that doing something without people looking at you right because i think that's the most important thing and also for for our listeners that are kind of growing that first hire can be really daunting but that first hire is your ticket to freedom right because until you pay somebody to do your job you're not free but then the moment you pay them even if you make no money and the business runs, you're free, right? So it's understanding that. So with all the years of experience that you have and knowing, because I know you've done some Airbnb, what do you think are some of the characteristics that would be good as a first right-hand man or woman for somebody that is, let's say, let's say is in similar to the situation that, Mike was in, right? They have five or six units. They're on the analytical, they're investors. So they understand the number aspects of it. Um, what would you, with all your experience, suggest this is probably a good hire for you, like psychologically, like some of the things that you will be looking for if you were like hiring people for a operation like that? Yeah, it's a, yeah, again, great, really great question. The thing that I would look for, like there's plenty of people out there that are really good at numbers, really good at process, really good at whatever skill you need to have done. But what I would look for is conscientiousness. Is someone who has a high level of self-awareness mm. and someone who knows how to speak to different groups of people. Because when you're working in hospitality, you are interacting with, with every level. You've got everything from bankers and investors to the pot washer and everything in between. 
And you, not only do you speak to, but you lead and you interact and you relate to people at, at those different levels in different ways. And one of the things about being a great leader is, is you need, is, is your, you have to be able to get work done through other people. And you do that by getting them to follow you. We just talked about it, right? Having a common vision and going somewhere collectively together. And it's that level of self-awareness and conscientiousness that separates really well, great leaders from managers. Mm. Mm. What a mic drop moment. Mike, we need to add sounds. Like I need, <laughs> we need a sound effect thing. Like, I don't know how that works, but I want it like a little thick. I love that. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, but before we wrap it up with our last question, where can folks uh, get in contact with you, learn more about your business and your consulting? Yeah. It, my, uh, the company's website is knowinghospitality.com. So you can learn everything about the company, everything we're doing. The podcast lives there. Uh, my contact information is there. And if you want to find me on, on social, any platform, it's at Adam Knight. Love it. So the last question that we ask all of our guests, and we've talked a lot about this, but maybe if there's something that we've missed, I'd love your two cents on this is, what is your number one secret to success with short-term rentals or hospitality? Ooh. Um, wow. Wow. Uh, Okay, not to wave, uh, waver too much on an answer here. You know, I would say, ooh, man, you stumped me a little bit there. I, I'm glad I would say, I'm glad I wouldn't tell you earlier because you would have hauled out some of the good stuff that you gave us. You <laughs> I know, I know. That. I'm tapped out. I have no yeah. other tidbits. No, I would say the number one thing uh, is, is, is something that I led with right at the beginning is that you're selling experiences. So how do you want people feeling when they leave your hotel or your vacation rental? And as soon as you could get into that mindset, it completely changes how you interact with the business and how you interact with your guests. Mm, not in my job. I love Adam. it. Well, this has been incredible, Adam. I really appreciate you taking the time to record this the day before Thanksgiving at five o'clock at night. Uh, <laughs> this was so packed with goodness. I am super grateful for you and um, truly, truly appreciate you coming on. I'm always happy to. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's great to talk to everybody and uh, I hope you guys have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, you too. Thanks, Adam. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Hey, STR Nation, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes, and we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.